Nihal, Mahaban, Assalamu Alaikum. Oh, good. <laughs> Hi, I'm here to talk to you today about a need for inclusivity within the Quranic understanding of Islam. So, let's get started because I was born in the year that Brown v. Board Education in 1954. And so for me, education has always been a very important thing to do. And so with that, growing up in Detroit, Michigan, the Motor City, Motown, I had the Supremes, the Temptations, and Marvin Gaye, and Aretha Franklin on the other ear, screaming it out. It was a wonderful place to grow up. People from all over the world came there. Why? The auto industry, engineers from everywhere, their families. I went to school with a number of them. I learned a lot about different types of religions. So it was really important for me that at eight years old, I told my parents, this Baptist church is not working for me. Can I try something else? And they said, yes, be our guest. And that's when I went forward. Well, that was wonderful. So in understanding this diversity of people, I came to understand that diversity is very important and that we should also try to be as diverse as possible in our thinking and how we interact with people. So this journey led me on a very long, and I do mean long journey, and through that process, I came to understand that Islam was my faith, but I also know that it needs reform. God said, love your enemy, and I obeyed God, and I loved myself. Uthman, who was the third caliph, there's a hadith that he actually did, but it's attributed to Prophet Muhammad, and it says, seek knowledge unto China. So, in 650 Common Era, Sayyid Waqas went to China to encourage the emperor to embrace Islam. Just imagine, 1,400 years later, I go to China and embrace Islam. Well, let me tell you how that journey started. I told you it was a long one, so stick with me. In 1982, I was sitting there after having a very successful career as a course stenographer. I went and I says, I'm not satisfied. What am I going to do? So meditating, I was envisioned to study Chinese and Arabic. Chinese and Arabic? What's this black guy going to be doing to Chinese and Arabic? But the inner voice said, go to Georgetown. Living in Washington, D.C., it was a bus ride from where I lived. I got there, and they said, we've been looking for you. Really? <laughs> Nine months later, I was on my way to Beijing University, where there, I met with my Uyghur and Hui Muslim, uh, Chinese Muslims there. And we talked about Islam. I told them, well, I know about NOI, Nation of Islam in the US, and some of the things of Salafis and Wahhabis, Wahhabis in the US. They said, no, 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 the real Islam. I was intrigued. So they told me, one of the fellows told me, he said, you know, my family's been Muslim for over 1,300 years. And as we talked more in depth about what Islam meant to him, I realized that this was a different Islam than what I had been told before. So after my first year of being in mainland China, or in China, I went on to Taiwan to continue my Chinese studies at Taiwan National University. And when I went to the mosque there in Taipei, oh my goodness, I realized there were two different Islams. In China, the Islam there, it was very opening and very welcoming to me. And when I got to Taiwan, it was one that was very exclusive. I felt sequestered, ostracized, rejected, forbidden. But not to be uh, undone, I finished my two years of additional studies, went back to Georgetown, began Arabic studies, and within nine months, I was thrust into Muslim lives again in Cairo, Amman, and Damascus for three years. 
had a chance to live with Muslims there and also to travel to many Muslim-led states. I really got a good grounding in Islam. But after graduation, I went on to law school, did my master's in Middle Eastern studies, and then another master's in Quranic interpretation and Islamic law. But there's something that I haven't shared with you yet, and that's another part of my diversity. I'm a gay activist, beginning just after Stonewall in 1969. My goodness, 1969, that long ago? Here's my first gay triangle from the time. This is 45 years old. But it has given me lots of strength. It has emboldened me. Because not unlike the civil rights movement that I worked in as a child, it also taught me that liberation of people was very important, men and women, so that they could live freely live life more fully. That was very important. So with my family support and feeling comfortable being a man loving man, something that society frowned upon, of course, I was able to move forward in my life and do the things I wanted to do. That was very important. But there I thrived. Now just imagine, three decades later, I'm in Saudi Arabia teaching and doing research on homosexuality and Islam. And lo and behold, wallahi, in Arabic that means like, oh my God. <laughs> I came to realize that there was nothing in the Quran that prevented someone who was homosexual from being Muslim. So I was not an oxymoron, oh my goodness. So I found out that it was not the Quran that people often say, well, it's in the Quran in that particular verse they did so and so and so. That's not true. Where did it come from? From the interpreters of the Quran. They brought their own biases in against homosexuality and wrote it in their translations. But when you read the Arabic, it doesn't say that. It can be read that way. But if you have a more inclusive concept, the Quran opens up like the unfolding of a lotus leaf. Rather than being stuck in the quagmire, choose the beautiful lotus flower. So with, that, right, with doing that, I decided to do my research. I wrote a thesis about it. And then I heard about in the US, an LGBT Muslim organization called Al Fatah. I contacted them, spoke to Faisal Alam, and I sent my research to him and disseminated it. Boy, was that wonderful. Romans, and among God's signs, God created for you mates from among yourselves, so you may dwell in tranquility with them and find love and mercy between your hearts. These are signs for those who reflect. And among God's signs, the creation of the heavens and the earth, and your tongues and colors, these are signs for those with lived experience who know. Well, tongues and colors are often translated as meaning languages and races, right? Tongues, colors, languages, races. But that's just the outside. The Quran frequently talks about the inner, the great, the unseen. So we talk about also the human part of us called the fitra, our internal makeup of who we are. So, of course, tongues can then mean tastes and styles. I like Coca-Cola, you like Sprite, you like fruit punch. Who likes orange over here? Okay, there you go. Then styles. I like to wear this particular style and this particular material, blah, blah, blah. But the idea of colors, where does the colors come from? Boy, it took me six months to really get through it. But when I realized it, it is people's temperaments. Some people are red in anger, yellow as cowards, green with envy, sad and blue, and so on. So 
Not unlike our fingerprints, we are uniquely different. And like a kaleidoscope, each human being is different. The last two decades, I came to realize that we need an Islamic reformation for a global understanding of Islam. How did I come to this? Well, in Islamic tradition, they had a thing that was called the salunat, or salons, where intellectuals from different parts of the, of the Muslim empire came together to discuss various aspects of their faith, as well as the worldly issues of their times. And through that process, it was now referred to generally as the golden age of Islam. But after that, we came to understand that just like in any group, students will start cutting you away, filling in the holes, doing those different things. So can you imagine that in Cairo, Baghdad, Khartoum, Medina, all these people coming together and making these unique differences. So Jews, Christians, Muslims came together and had great intellectual growth. And some of the things that we have today, such as hospitals, mental health, ophthalmology, the precursor to the compass, algebra, Arabic numbers, and so much more came from those discussions. And Ibn Khartoum said, unthinkingly following ancient customs and traditions does not mean that the dead are alive, but that the, dead, that the living are dead. What does that mean? Well, Islamic scholars today tell us, people like Fazlur Rahman and Muhammad Mahmoud Taha, Khalid um, Abu Fadl, and Amin al-Wudud. They say about every 150 years or so, there's usually a spiritual revival and then some type of legal reform. Now, when those things happened, people began to live better lives. So for example, in 1858, during the Ottoman Empire, they decriminalized homosexuality. Yes, decriminalized, you got me right. And here we are 150 years later, and the Quranic clock is ticking, tick, 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 looking for social change, looking for difference, spiritual understanding about women, gender, and sexual orientation. So, Rumi, many of you probably know, has a poem that for mystical lovers, I, you, he, she, we. In the garden of mystical lovers, these are not true distinctions. I, you, he, she, we. We're in the 21st century, technically advanced, we need to re understand the Quran for today. Does it mean that we change everything? No. We maintain our standards, how we treat each other as human beings, but do we have to do the same way that they did it before? Do you ride a camel to work? I'm serious. No. But we do have the same uh, courtesies, you know what I'm saying? Like if somebody's coming first, you part, you hold on. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. That's right. So now what we need is that we have to reinterpret the Quran for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. So important. But this means that there's a paradigm shift, and we have to change this east-west kerfuffle. Yes, and it has to be changed with a chorus of Muslim voices all calling for change. So Mecca, the institute I work with, honors this work, and we know that people are craving for the greater truths, and we're going to try our best to help them get it. But nonetheless, we're all in this together, all of us, me, you, he, she, we. We're all in this together, and it's a good sign and a blessing that we're able to understand Quran in alternative ways. If the Wahhabis want to think a certain way, fine. The Salafists want to think a certain way, fine. The Sufis think some way, fine. And progressives can think another way. And it all works. Everybody can choose from which one that they really like. And there's harmony there if we live it. So why? 
Well, let me say this to you. In some of my lectures, I generally talk to people and I say, you know, in today's world, probably 150 years from now, we'll have humankind living on other planets, doing whatever they'll be doing. And I got a question for you. Which way is Kaaba for prayer time? Of course, they look at me and I tell them, I don't know. But I'm sure the Muslims of the future will have that answer. So we can never say that the Quran at one particular time is for all of time, but it's for that particular time and for this particular time and for a future period of time. That's what the importance is, learning to understand Quran in a different way. So I like to end with my poem with Rumi. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you've broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again, come, come. I look forward to providing those believers who are seeking a new way an opportunity to discuss the issue. Thank you.